Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient's live talk. And this is Nicholas Chan, reporter with Being Patient. And today, uh, we'll, we'll be speaking with Emily Ong, uh, who lives in Singapore, about her series of uh, misdiagnoses before finally receiving a provisional diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia at the age of 51. Um, so thank you so much, Emily, for, for joining us. Happy to be here. Um, Emily, you know, before we speak about uh, your diagnosis, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, prior to your diagnosis, you know, before this interview, we talked a little bit about your, um, your volunteer work as a consultant. Can you tell us a little bit about that, uh, that work? Sure. Yeah, uh, I was uh, trained in early childhood, but uh, because uh, I, I come across a lot of uh, young children who have special needs, but, uh, but the school does not accept them. So that sort of uh, changed my, my whole perspective and moved towards you know, my work to work with children with special educational needs. And, and then uh, uh, and since then, I have always been working with the learners with ADHD or autism or learning disability. Yeah. So, and then another thing is that uh, I, I work either on case-to-case -case basis or I conduct training for preschool teacher to encourage them to include children with special needs in the mainstream classroom. Yeah. And is that, are you still doing that work currently, you know, after a diagnosis, have you still been involved with uh, doing consulting work in this area? Um, not for one-to-one -one basis though, because, uh, because of my connection changes, I start to have confusion of the fine details of the different types of uh, special needs area. Uh, but then I'm still able to give a, a global you know, perspective and intervention and things like that. So occasionally I still have school in Singapore that invite me to go in and provide support for the teachers and, and parents who had children with special educational needs in mainstream school. Yes. I mean, th that must be a great way to, you know, con you know, continue what you've been passionate about doing, right? Uh, even yes. after your diagnosis. And, and that's, that's, that's very important, I'm sure, for you, right? Yes, because I have lost so much of my training, my years of training, and, and, uh, and to, to be able to continue to, uh, to contribute in my own small way with whatever that is left in me, that is very beautiful. And I guess the most beautiful part is that the, the school and the parents know that I have dementia, and they, they, they still respect and work together with me and don't don't feel like discounted whatever my sharing is not important because she has dementia. And that really, you know, sort of put me uh, in, a, in, in a position whereby I feel that I'm still of value and still respected for, for my expertise, yes. Right, so, you know, people are aware of, you know, your, your diagnosis of FTD, but, um, but they respect, uh, like you said, mm. they respect the work and the help that you provide for them, right? And, and that, again, means a lot to you. And I'm sure that means a lot for them too, right? Yes, um, and, yeah. yeah. Um, and Emily, let's talk a little bit then about, you know, your, the early symptoms uh, mm. of FTD that you started to notice um, in 2017. Tell us a little bit about, you know, what that was like for you and, you know, what, what you notice in, in, the, in the early days. Oh, well, actually, for me, is that uh, the first thing I noticed is the significant decline in my executive functioning, like, you know, like planning. Whenever our, my family go for a holiday trip, whether is it just within our own country, Malaysia, I come from Malaysia, uh, or overseas, I'm the one who is, will be having all the detailed planning, you know, where to stay, where to eat, places to go, and things like that and until very detailed plan. But now I'm no longer able to do that. You know, like this coming June, I will be going to, uh, uh, to London for the first time in my life to, to deliver my presentations at the ADI conference 2022. I cannot do that. So my daughter put in the app for me called Waterlog for me to go and find out 
I, I also struggle to, to use the app, you know. I can only say, okay, these are the places that I like to go. And then organizing, I take so much time to organize things. And uh, multitasking is definitely not a thing that I can do. You know, most is I can do two, two tasks at one time, but the, the, re the chance of getting one of the tasks with more mistakes is very high as compared to just focus on one. And I cannot handle group conversations. You know, if there is more than two people and they come with multiple topics, I will be totally off. You know, I, you will find me very quiet there, sitting there very quiet. <laughs> yeah, so these are the changes that, are, that, that I start to find in, in myself. But the problem is that unlike memory, it, it is not noticeable by people. You know, people were not you know, able to notice that, oh, she has a decline in her planning and things like that. Because all this, you do it at the back, right? So I put in so much effort, like for example, having this interview with you. I, I, you won't be able to see the hours that I have put in on my notes and to prepare for this. But what people see is just the end product. And the conclusion is that, Emily, you're still okay. You know, you're still super duper efficient. <laughs> yeah. So that is a very tough, uh, uh, what you call getting the doctor to, to accept that there is changes to my cognition. Yeah, it's, it's very tough. Right. Because, you know, you're able to find ways to compensate for, you know, the decline in, say, like executive functioning, like mm. planning things like that, right? Yes. When you compensate for it, it's hard for people to really notice that something's yes, actually going Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and also because I work in disability field and I have been helping children with learning disability. So when I start to realize that what, I, what I'm experiencing is, is in a way very similar to the children that I work with in the disability. So I start to incorporate that strategy that I, I re would recommend to my learners or myself. So it's also help to compensate like what you said and then to, and, and, and all these are so subtle that you do at the background, people will not be able to realize that there's so much effort. You know, last time I not need to put so much effort, but now I need to put so much effort and so much time into it. Mm, right. And so at what point, you know, did you, you know, go to the doctor to say like, oh, there's something wrong with me? Like, was there, you know, a tipping point for you where you knew that you had to go see a doctor? Yeah, yeah. it was um, my, 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 the trigger thing is when on the morning I'm supposed to prepare French toast and I always call that my French toast incident that's part of the whole thing. I, I basically cannot remember how to make French toast other than I have a lot of bread as I know I need it. And, uh, and what's, uh, other than that, I have no recollection of how to make it. But somehow I have in my feeling, I feel that I know, but the brain say, no, you don't know. No, there is this uh, contradiction there. And, uh, and it was so fortunate that my elder daughter at that time was first year medical student and she just studied about dementia. And it's like, mom, that is not normal to, to, to suddenly don't know how to do a recipe that you have been doing since I was very young until now. You know, you, you suddenly cannot know. So you need to go and see a neurologist. So that was, that, that, that was a time whereby, you know, we decided to go to see a neurologist. But unfortunately, that is not my first time I go and see neurologist. The first time I see the neurologist was in, uh, in I think should be in the beginning, maybe Mashka or what, I cannot remember, in 2017. When I see a neurologist, not because uh, uh, what you call, it is a reference to go and see a neurologist because I was having sleeping problem. And, uh, but you know that uh, no, thyroid will give you a sleeping issue also. But my thyroid uh, situation had, uh, had recovered already and I still have this uh, sleeping issue. So that is where I was referred to see a neurologist. And then the first neurologist was so convinced that the, the insomnia that I have is the root cause. And after doing the, the uh, 
P P P E T P E T uh uh scan. Uh, yeah, PET scan, okay. yes. Yeah, the one that they inject the dye, and then uh, they found that uh, there was a standard deviation of minus three in my uh uh tem uh tem tem temple temporal. Temporal. yeah, yes, yeah. And then uh, it and then based on their previous record of another patient, uh, the, the, the neurologist together with the radio, radio, radiologist felt that I have fatal familial insomnia, FFI, you know. And uh, so I was I was told that, you know, I will uh, my my cognition will degenerate and then uh, you know, yeah. Is 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 because it's vital means that another I'm given a, a a a very short time to prepare and and to my my life, yeah. So that was my first time I see the neurologist, but uh, surprisingly, you know, after uh, looking back, is that during that time when I see the neurologist, I also do this uh, mocha test and things like that. And the result keep on dropping from, uh, I think it's 25 or 26 upon 30, and then drop all the way to 17 upon 30. The doctors still don't think that it is, there's no mention of cognitive impairment or possibility of dementia, but instead I was treated for FFI and was on benzodiazepine for a few months. And that was, um, I, that was such a heavy drug and it do not nothing to me because Cognitively, my condition continued to decline. Yeah, and and neither does it help with my uh you know my my situation of poor the, the sleep. I become need the medication to make me to sleep. Yeah. So so after that, my whole family also felt that it is a wrong diagnosis. So we we didn't want to go back to see the doctor. So the second time I see the neurology was the French toss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so after the French toast diagnosed, um, sorry, after the French mm. toast incident, uh, you, mm. you went to uh, the neurologist, um, and, and then what happened? Uh, and then uh, the doctor said that uh, he is very confident that I have young onset Alzheimer. Yeah, and uh, so I was on excellent page. But unfortunately, after after the after the the, the lumbar puncture and uh, the the brain scan come back and show that I don't have Alzheimer, so that is another blow to me, you know, another misdiagnosis. So so the excellent patch, uh, like all the other heavy drugs, had to be slowly removed from the body system. Yeah. So so yeah. So it is. Uh, then after that, uh. They start to observe me again, back to square one, start over again, and uh, and then uh, they they start to felt that to put me on provisional frontal temporal dementia. Hmm. Got it. And wasn't there also a point where the doctors felt like you had you know psychiatric issues? Yes. Well? Yeah. And so yeah, can you like, at what? Is that when they thought you know you had psychiatric issues? Yeah. So so then the other thing is that uh, they felt that uh, I have uh, what you call mood and uh, not anxiety and uh, depression. So they put me on uh, what you call this uh, SSRI. Uh, what you call is it selective serotonin reuptake something? And I was on fluoroscopy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was on for sitting for a few years, I think for three years, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, and it, 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 it sort of made me very cool, like a cucumber. But, the, but for me, is that uh, I felt that my earlier incidents of panic attack and things like that in the crowded places is because no one uh, no, uh, showed me that it is because of the changes in my cognition and the processing and things like that 
that overwhelms my, my system. So that is why I have this panic attack because I only have panic attack and anxiety in crowded, noisy places. So after I come to hear from other people and, and things like that, and then I start to see, okay, this is what I do for children who have you know, autism, you know, to avoid crowded places. Then I start to put strategy into it. And I found that I don't have, I, I, I no longer experience anxiety and panic attack. So I asked the doctor to, to remove, I don't want to take the medication anymore. But uh, again, it was very difficult because he is a doctor and I have no proof to show that it is, I, I don't have mood swing or, or depression or things like that. Yeah, so, but was very a blessing that uh, because of my cataract surgery, the, doc, the eye surgeon said that my eyes is very dry, which is something that I have been telling my doctor, my neurologist, while I was on fluoxetine. And it's because of that doctor, that eye surgeon who mentioned that in the letter, then he is willing to remove and stop me from, you know, stop this. Uh, uh, for a sitting and I no longer take it and I'm so happy that it has been I think one year plus I, I don't have panic attack or, or things like that you know because I put in strategy and I, I start to believe in myself that I, I have a control in my own life and I, I, know, I, I don't have depression and as what I was taught and I think this is very important because uh Women, we, we, we are always being uh, straight away will assume that we will have depression, it's menopause, and, and that is affecting your conviction and things like that. So I, I don't know, that could be causing all this misdiagnosis, you know, that the doctors is not listening enough. Yeah. Right. And Emily, I just wanted to clarify the timeline of events because mm. I know it's complicated and it's... Um, and went through a series of misdiagnoses, as, as we mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, um, but in terms of, uh, you know, the psychiatric issues, in terms of, you know, depression and mm -hmm. anxiety, was that, um, was that before you were, you were misdiagnosed with uh, fatal familiar insomnia, or was it after the FF? It was after. So fatal familiar insomnia first, mm -hmm. and then after that, young onset Alzheimer. And then after that is the, uh, this what you call this depression and things like that. And then it come together with FFI is more or less the same thing. So when I was under uh, provisional FTD, I was also on prositine, yeah. Got it. And yeah, I was wondering, you know, when you finally received that provision diagnosis of frontal temporal dementia you know how did you feel like did you have any suspicion that would this be the wrong diagnosis again or you know were you and your doctor um, more mm. certain about this diagnosis yeah uh, for me is that I I felt that this this uh, FTD is more correct description of what I'm going through uh, but the, the, the doctor felt that the FTD is more of behavioral variant, that variant rather than language. But for me, as a person who, who is the first-hand experience the changes, to me, I felt that my, my changes in my behavior is less. I only have certain social rules that I am no longer aware of. Like for example, when in a queue, you know, there are things that you can do and things that you cannot do, like you cannot cut queue and things like that. Uh, and then, to, but in terms of the language, I found that I have declined a lot in my language, but that is something that uh, the, the doctors uh, doesn't feel that I have language issue. Yeah. Can can you tell us a little bit about, you know, some of the language issues that, you know, you do encounter um, currently now? Like, how do, how do your language issues, you know, affect your daily life then? 
Yeah, for me is that I have lots of issue with coming up the word, the word, and I, I know in my head, but I cannot say it out, and and that affects me in my conversations, day to day conversation with my family, and unless the person is in the context that I am in, then the person can support me. Uh, the other things that I have is that uh, I'm starting to have the problem of uh, the semantic part of the language. Like for example, if if uh, if a uh, if a menu is given to me without a picture attached to the name of the dish, sometimes not all the time, but sometimes I get confused and I don't know just by reading the text. What is this dish is like? Or is this what is it? So, so there is this this association between the meaning of the of the dish to to my understanding. So, uh, so this is lately. This is what is changing. Uh, uh, I'm experiencing. Yeah. So now today, you know, when I go to go to order thing, I need to have the picture. So. To be sure that I know what is this dish referring to, yeah. Mm, right. Or like, you know, as we as we talked about, you know, at the start of the interview, like, or if you have an interview like this, then you would prepare, like, you would have uh, a lot of preparation. Oh yes, for... see, see, see. <laughs> 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 to help to make sure that not uh, so much to uh, yeah. to 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 make sure that uh, I have all the words, you know. So, so this yeah. really helps me because if I were just to uh, talk offhand like that and I won't be able to know what question that might come along, even though we already have roughly an idea, but, uh, but to, to have the paper in front of me is like giving me, okay, these are the words that you can use. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It gives you the vocabulary. Uh, the yes. vocabulary for a conversation. Mm. Um, so it seems like, you know, the way, you, you know, you've described it is that, you know, the doctors feel like, you know, the, the main problem for you is the behavioral issues, whereas mm. you feel like um, it's really the language that's the main issue uh, for you. So I'm wondering, like, then, is that a frustration for you? Like, that the doctors are, you know, what the doctors are telling you doesn't seem to be aligning with, you know, what you're experiencing yes. in your day-to-day -day life. Yeah, I, 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 I just had my uh, 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 recent conversation with, with my doctor because my, my neurologist has moved on and joined another hospital. So now my case is being transferred to another neurologist and it's uh, starting the journey all over again. And the frustration is building up again. And, uh, he, and, and, and it is very difficult because, uh, because he knows me as a dementia advocate and he knows that I talk a lot. And he, he, from that, he doesn't seem to agree that I have language issue. And uh, so his, he was just say that, see all the, neuropsychological testing show that you can do, you can describe, I give you a picture, you can describe, I give you three words, you can say it back. And uh, so I don't see that is any language issue. But for me, I told him that maybe you need to spend a day with me and uh, be part of me day to day activity whereby nothing is uh, not Thing is not like it's a repeat because all those tests is a repeat. It's the exact same picture, exact same word also. So of course, you know, my memory is not affected. I will be able to remember what you want me to say. So, but if you are with me, you know, on my day to day, things are not so expected. You know, you never know what people will bring up or ask you and things like that. So you, you cannot prepare of hand and there is no repetition of the same thing. Yeah, then I say you will be able to see how the language changes affect me. So what does he say in response when when you tell him that? He still feels that 
I'm still very capable. And uh, if I have language issue, I should not be able to do any kind of advocacy and be standing there and talking. And, uh, uh, you know, that if I, uh, whatever words finding I have is just very minor, you know, it's not in, uh, interfering into my day to day. So I just felt that, you know, even though uh, I, you know, they are very well trained in, in, in this field, I, I always feel that the diagnosis is still a very subjective thing based on what they see in the patient and, uh, and their interpretation of the assessment. And, and uh, based on that, they will say, okay, whether this person had dementia or no dementia. And which to me is, it is not an accurate with a 15 minute discussion you cannot say whether you cannot you cannot uh, what you call uh, make a decision and say that okay i don't think the language you are having the issue is affecting or interfering your life i i felt that is not a fair thing to do and uh, i that that is why i i i make it a point in my advocacy that you no know, med, med, medical professionals have to change the way they see dementia in women because we are so different and uh, there is need to be a more you know, a gender-based approach to diagnosis and uh, also in, the, in terms of looking into the risk factor. Like for example, for me, I have surgical menopause when I was in my 30, when I was 30 years old because due to enteromatrices. And we know that estrogen is very important for the protection of the neuron. And I don't have that because my body reacts to the hormone uh, ter ter therapy replacement. And uh, uh, so, and then they start to have a lump on my breast. So, so because of that, I, I no longer have estrogen after age of 33. And so that, if you based on research, there is an increase, a huge increase of, you know, of the, the risk for dementia. But every time I bring it up that, it was just, you know, dismissed off because it is not listed as a risk factor in our general, you know, risk for dementia is not listed as a risk factor. So I, so, so, so to me, uh, it, dementia is such a complex thing and, uh, and you cannot say that uh, men and women uh, are affected the same way, share the same risk factor also. And so hence it has to be uh, more gender specific so that we can work together to minimize the risk of you know, the, the series of unfortunate misdiagnosis and unnecessary drugs for us because it is a huge blow for us as a patient whenever there's a misdiagnosis involved. Hmm. Right, and, and you, you have participated in research, right, uh, in, in, in the field. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, your participation in, in research then? Uh, for, for me, it's that um, I have participated in research in, uh, in local and overseas, but the problem is that uh, uh, the the one that I participate in the local one, the uh, we we are more like as a participant and uh, and for for data collection and and hence, you oh know, the the feedback that we provide, I don't know how much is being incorporated into changing the way a research should be done. So so it is. Uh, 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 very, very sad thing, <laughs> you know, because we are just to provide data only, yeah. But we, we know that, you know, uh, there are so many research consistently show that, you know, there need to be a, a different type of uh, diagnosis method for, for women as compared to men, yeah. 
And, you know, Emily, just wondering if there's anything that I forgot to ask and haven't asked that you'd like to speak about, you know, I know you prepared a lot for this interview, so I want to make sure that we touch upon all the points that you prepared uh, in your notes. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, for me, is that uh, I, 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 I just want to say that, you know, uh, advocacy on women and dementia is a very key focus for us at Dementia Alliance International. That is the organization by and for people living with dementia. And because you, you, we know that globally, there are more women than men affected by dementia. And uh, you know, there is, despite there is two thirds of the 57 million people living with dementia are women and older women. You know, the, the diagnosis of gender-based diagnosis is very, you know, uh, overlooked. And so I, I, my, well, one thing that I, I want is that for researcher or, or medical professional to, to really understand that, you know, dementia is complex and it is unlike diabetes, you know, you can quantify it based on a certain number on the blood test. And uh, so it, it is there, there is a need to work together with the patient even more to, to minimize you know, and to have more accurate diagnosis so that women will not be missed up in the early diagnosis and getting the necessary intervention. And uh, so that is uh, what you call, uh, and then, and also for, for women, a lot of them, like me, like that, we spend most of our time as a homemaker. And even for me, I'm involved in voluntary work that doesn't have performance appraisal. So any change in my connection will not be reflected unlike men who normally will have jobs that have performance appraisal. So they, they will be able, there is an alert there, you know, there is a changes in their performance, but for women, we are not. So these are the things that, you know, the researcher and the medical professional need to take into consideration on how to help women to have an earlier diagnosis of dementia, uh, rather than, you know, based on the current way of doing things is that women always get diagnosed later. And, and then, uh, uh, what do you call, and then by the time they are diagnosed, they are at the late stage and the progression is always seem to be faster which is, again, not a correct reflection of dementia in women. Mm. Right. And I was wondering, how about from, you know, the patient perspective then, you know, because, you yeah. know, the diagnosis of dementia, you know, it's, it's quite often very stigmatizing and um, there's, it's very personal and it's, um, you know, I think, I'm not sure, you know, I was wondering, you know, in terms of like for, women in, um, you know, in countries in Asia, do you feel like yeah. there's a big, difficult for people to speak out about, um, yes. you know, their own diagnosis? What, what's your thought on that? Yeah, for, uh, especially in Asia, women has always been sick. It's, uh, it's more like, it's seen but not heard, that kind of culture. And if you are, if you are a woman and you are living with dementia, it further, you know, it's a double blow of a, of a stigma. So, so uh, when I was uh, diagnosed with dementia, dementia, the first thing I do is I set up a, a Facebook page, living with dementia, uh, living with mild cognitive impairment and YOD. My, my aim is to get people to start to talk and normalize that conversation about dementia and that you should not feel afraid you should not feel ashamed that you have dementia. You know, it, it should be taken just like any other medical condition. And, uh, and uh, of course, the stigma is still very high. And, uh, and of, uh, if you look around in Asia, the number of uh, speaker, uh, dementia advocate is comparatively less as to the West, uh, to the European country. Yeah, but things are changing, uh, changing. But the problem is that I found the biggest obstacle of why there are uh, less people 
uh, uh, dementia advocate, it's not just purely to uh, stigma as per se that they don't dare to step up. It's because of the stigma to attach to dementia and which the family would like to, okay, don't reveal it to other people. And then, uh, and also don't want to go and seek up medical help. Yeah. So by the time the person is, uh, is the decline is so much that the family cannot, no longer can stand, only then they sign it for a diagnosis. Then uh, very soon, these people are no longer able to become uh, uh, functioning at the level that they can have a conversation. So, so uh, for in Asia region, that is the two things that we need to tackle. You know, it's not just uh, uh, dementia, uh, dementia as uh, the stigma has to be tackled in, in, in two angles. Yeah. Right. And, you know, you mentioned about how, you know, the families, you know, families might not want to, you know, tell, you know, reveal mm. a loved one's diagnosis. I was wondering, how about, you know, when you decided to, you know, speak to the public about mm. your own diagnosis? You know, what did your family, how did your family feel about that then? Yeah, my family is very supportive, but I am, I am, uh, because uh, for me is that uh, I always very protective of them because I, I, I know that the stigma is still very high. So whenever I go out for, for my advocacy, I never disclose the fine details of my family members. I will just give a brief general because I felt that I don't want people to walk up to my husband and say, that, hey, how is your wife huh? when I go out with him? And that will make him feel very hurt. You know, that, that the, the pers the, his friend or colleague will have to whisper to his, yes, how is your wife? Huh? Now, now all to my children. Yeah, so, so for that, I, 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 I will never, uh, I felt that it is not the right time yet to review my family members to the public uh, until the day when by the society is able to have a conversation about dementia, uh, like any other, like, like, like we can talk about cancer like that without that stigma on the family, because I think it's too much of a price for the family members to pay. And I'm already very happy that they don't mind for me to disclose who I am, you know, my name, my appearance and things like that. And, and, the, and my younger daughter is the one who helped me to do all my presentation and put it in order. And, and sometimes she will you know, accompany me to the, to the venue and then I'll ask her to, to exit because I don't want reporters and things like that to trail her and ask her. And then, you know, because uh, the, 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 the focus should be on the person living with dementia and not make a story and headline out of the family members because they already pay, they are already going through a lot when someone in their family is living with dementia. Right, it's very much a balancing act for you. Yes. You know, you're grateful for your family to um, to be open for you to share your diagnosis and speak openly about it. But, you know, at the same time, you respect their privacy by not revealing, mm. you know, their, their identity, right? And yes. You, you balance the best. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, last question here, Emily, then. Then, you know, the bottom line is, I was wondering, you know, how did you push through and really decide to you know speak out about your diagnosis and with you know with all the you know you know the challenges of you know coming out about it you know how did you know what was the bottom line for you in terms of why do you speak mm. out about you know your diagnosis yeah for me i like what i said when i was diagnosed in 2017 there was no one to work together with me and for uh and i felt that no one who receive a diagnosis of dementia to work the journey by themselves. And, and uh, so I decided that, okay, I will take that step, you know, to, to show that, okay, I'm living with dementia. Yes, I'm in the Asia culture here. And, uh, 
and let me do it and be the first person and hopefully it will cre create the ripple effect and other people who see me stepping up will also equally do so. And uh, to be very frank, I'm very happy that now there are more and more people, even women who are living with dementia, young people like me, young women like me, like that, not all people, uh, who are also stepping up and, and, and share, you know, in Chinese. Uh, yeah, so that is, uh, that is, that is something that I'm, I, I felt that is very worthwhile for all the sacrifice that I made. And, uh, and of course, for us, uh, I cannot say about other people, but for myself, I felt that ever since I stepped up, I have a, I have a good encouraging support from people. At the same time, I'm also heavily criticized by people for saying, because they based on what they see that I can talk like this with you. Then they say that I am not having dementia and I'm using dementia as a leverage to uh, get myself into the public eye, yeah. So yeah, I, I do receive comment that is very harsh, but to me, I felt that everyone has the right to their to to have an opinion, and uh, it's very sad that there are people who are not well educated and uh, don't have that knowledge. So for that, I just take it as like that, and. Uh, so it makes me that, okay, I need to even work harder because I still receive comments like that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure it's very fulfilling for you to know that, you know, the work you do like, like today, just by speaking about your own journey is threading the needle a little bit and helping, you know, with, you know, showing your face will help others yeah. know that, you know, it's okay to speak out about it, right? So. Yes. So, so I, well, it's just like, you know, whenever I do this kind of uh, uh, global interview, it is my very wish that someone in Asia who is living with dementia will actually step up and, and talk about it. And uh, that, 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 is, that is the main strong motivator for me to take up a global interview because I, I want my, my friends who are living with dementia in other parts of Asia to, to have the bravery to step up and just like the, their counterparts in, in the European country, you know, to have the courage to step up. Yeah, because that's the only way we can really break the stigma and discrimination to have the people who's living with dementia to, to, to share, to talk about it, to openly talk about it, yeah. And what do you think is like a good step then for people if they do want to speak, you know, about their diagnosis? What's like a good first step to, to even begin their advocacy work? Would it be like to reach out to an organization like um, ADI, Alzheimer's mm. Disease International, right? That's what it stands for, ADI. Mm. How, how do they begin? I think the first thing is that uh, uh, they would be good for them to uh, get in contact with their own local Alzheimer Association, uh, and then uh, and if and if they can have a connection uh, to with Dementia Alliance International, like the organization that I'm in, where I learn a lot about advocacy because all of us inside there in the whole organization are people living with dementia. So it sort of give you that strength, you know, that you are not alone in this advocacy. Actually, you have a whole bunch in the organization who are working on the same topic. So, yeah, so that is very important. And uh, in Asia, uh, we, uh, uh, the, the first thing is that I think I had to start small. You know, when, when I first start, like what I said, I start with my Facebook page first. You know, I don't really come out and say, I show my appearance, this is me, this is how Emily look like, but I do my sharing in the Facebook. And once I feel comfortable, I move on to the next stage, you know, to, up, to be interviewed you know, uh, by, by newspaper and, and local newspaper and things like that. And then you, you feel comfortable and then you move one step, uh, take, take one step at a time to at your comfort level, yeah. And yeah, to build your confidence one step at a time and 
you know, you, yes. then, you know, you, you get better at telling your own story over time as you do it more. Right? So Yes, correct. Because uh, being an advocate, you know, you, you, you need to have that belief in yourself that whatever you say is what you believe in. Because like it or not, there'll be questions that come in, you might not be uh, able to, uh, you, you might not be able to take it. But if you have that belief in yourself, you will always know how to tackle the most difficult question or question that you felt that you are uncomfortable with. You can just say that, I'm sorry, I cannot answer that question. I don't like to take that question. And so these are all advocacy, advocacy skill that takes time to build up. So, so normally is that when I work with uh, beginning advocates, I always tell them that take it slow, you know, do what you can. Don't try to jump and take interviews and things like that because you, know, you, you might put yourself in a position that you feel very uncomfortable. And then, and that is why some people who jump on not prepared, they get this very bad feeling about it. And then they say, okay, no, no more advocacy. You know, they feel that the experience has been very bad. So take it very slowly. Yeah. It's a little bit the same for me as a reporter. You know, when I first started doing these live interviews, I, I was, I felt pretty nervous about it, um, speaking to folks like yourself. But you know, with each interview, you build your confidence and you understand yes. a little bit more, and you deepen your perspective, and um, and and you can really, um, and you enjoy it. Um, so yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and well, it's 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 a two way thing. You know, you get to be more sensitive of what are the questions that can be asked or not be asked. And then you also get to know, okay, if I were to ask, you know, uh, maybe I need to ask for the person, whether is the, the person is feel comfortable to talk about it. The, the same way for us also, we also know that, okay, roughly these are the questions and we will be very upfront with you. Okay, do we want to be asked on this or not? So it, it takes two to make, sound that's what it take two hand to clap right <laughs> yeah well thank you so much emily for um for speaking with us and for spending the time to prepare for this interview and for doing this interview um thank you so much thank you, thank you. it's my pleasure and mm -hmm. for our audience if you've missed any of this live talk uh we'll have a recording of the interview uploaded on youtube and We'll have a transcript on our website as well. Uh, and if you haven't um, signed up for a newsletter yet, don't forget to do so on our website. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.